this lesson, I'm going to share with you the top five guitar chord practice pitfalls and how you can avoid them. No matter where you are in your guitar journey, avoiding these mistakes is guaranteed to make your chords sound better and to help your practice be more effective. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm Jared from SoundGuitarLessons.com, a professional guitarist and teacher from Seattle. I'm here to help you become a proficient and well-rounded guitarist so you can express yourself freely and authentically on the guitar. If that sounds good, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. I have new lesson videos every Tuesday. And this is gonna be a good one. I've been doing this big series called How to Learn Guitar Chords, and this is the fifth episode in that series. There's a link in the description to see all the episodes. I started out this series with 14 chord shapes that everyone should know, and then I went into episode two, three, four with a bunch of theory stuff, chord structure on the guitar, scale structure, where chords come from, how to label them, how to identify them. Really great stuff, really important stuff for having full creative control over music on the guitar but I did start to get some comments from people about just how physically challenging it is to work on guitar chords and get them to sound good just from a technique perspective so awesome yes I totally hear you thank you for speaking up and that's why this video is just all about technique and execution and helping through some of those challenges we're gonna go over the top five things that people are doing wrong in their guitar chord practice and I'm gonna show you with some popular song examples how you can do these things the right way to get your chords sounding great we'll be addressing these five troubling topics dealing with chord transitions how to avoid playing strings that we don't want to hear working on the dreaded bar chord and where pressure should be coming from in our left hand and hand Hint, you should not be squeezing with your left hand. For number four, I'll tell you a little known secret about how to make chords super smooth when transitioning in a finger picking style. And lastly, I wanna share something that I call orchestrating on the guitar, which trust me, it is a game changer. In addition to these five tips, I wanna give you something really tangible to practice. So at the end, I'm gonna give you uh, just a quick explanation of the very best exercise to do for working on chord transitions. And I also have a free chord chart resource with a ton of awesome chord shapes that you can use to practice all this stuff with. All right, let's dive in. Pitfall number one is waiting too long to transition. Getting to the next chord on time when you're playing chord progressions is way more important than playing the previous chord the full duration of where it sits in time in the piece of music. So we actually have to leave a chord early to get to the next one on time. This tip pretty much only applies to strumming chords in chord progressions, but it's so important. You have to stop a chord some amount early to get to the next chord on time. We're totally prioritizing getting to that next chord on time. So a couple ways to do that. One, you could just stop the sound and stop it early and then get to the next chord on time. Or if you want the texture and the energy to keep going, you keep strumming even though you're lifting the chord off. That means you'd be strumming open strings or clicking notes and it seems like that would sound really bad, but this is what is happening. Doesn't matter the chord or the key, it's what's happening in guitar playing that you're hearing every single day any strumming guitar playing has this little moment of kind of sloppy nothingness happening still the energy the texture kind of open strings or clicking sounds happening in between chords changing and we don't even really notice it it's just the kind of the nature of the instrument and the style and the texture so we want to actually practice this on purpose to get our chord progressions sounding really good all right let's do a couple song examples this is the chord progression of the song just like heaven by the cure it's a e b minor d so i stopped right there in this moment that i'm talking about where i strummed open strings, the D lifted off, and that gives me this moment to get to the A. Really was noticeable when I stopped there, but not necessarily so noticeable when I was actually playing in time, but it was happening between every single chord. Now I'm gonna do it much slower and try to emphasize those moments so you really can pick them out. One of these notes from the open strings is not even in the key, so it should be a really sour note, yet this is still the normal thing to do.
Now, I was exaggerating it there. In reality, sometimes when you're switching chords, you can slightly be touching the string still and get more of a clicking sound and not necessarily always all the open string sounds. Usually it's a combination of a little bit of both. And sounds fine. Here's another example on the song Space Oddity by David Bowie that has these movable kind of bar chord shapes moving around. <laughs> Again, I'm kind of exaggerating it, but it's definitely there. And if you go listen to the record, you'll absolutely hear it, especially on the first chord transition. That. And I'm doing it a little extra on the other chords because um, it's what helps me avoid squeak on this particular guitar, depending on the guitar and the strings. And if I have a wound, ooh, you really hear that there. The third string is wound on this guitar, but not on an electric guitar. So I might approach it differently for different uh, guitars that I'm playing. Pitfall number two is accidentally playing open strings in the chord that you don't actually want. Most people are familiar with this challenge. If you're playing a C chord, you don't want this low E string in there. Usually, technically, that is a note that's in the chord, but we do not, by default, want that to be the lowest note. So we want to mute it uh, by touching the bottom of the string with this third finger here. That sound is fine. You're not going to hear that come through. Even though it's on its own, you really do hear it as a, as a uh, bit of a harmonic. So muting the string by touching it somewhere is one of the ways. The other way is that you simply just have to not strum it. So on a D chord, we have to get used to aiming for, actually aim for the top three strings in order to make sure you don't accidentally hit. Don't aim for the top four strings. Even though the top four strings are what the chord is, if you aim for the top four strings, you're gonna hit the fifth string or even more. So I aim for less and then get that in there. Another thing you can do is really, of course, practice very accurately playing just the root and then strumming after that. Certain kind of stylistic sound, but really good for starting to get used to pinpointing a specific string. So in the Just Like Heaven progression that I just played, in the A chord, I need to just be really careful not to play the E. Some people will mute with their thumb. I don't do that at all. It's fine that some people do. I don't. E is everything. B minor, I have to touch the bottom of the string with the first finger. There's that sound. But you don't hear it come through with the chord. And then of course, D in that progression, I just need to be really careful not to strum the bottom two strings. Pitfall number three, squeezing your grip with your left hand. This is the big one. We should not be squeezing our grip. That is really the wrong word. If you feel like that would describe what you're doing, not good. I have a student that calls this the grip of death. I really like that. It's like when we're focusing more on the notes or the music or whatever else, we just like get tighter and tighter and tighter. So let me be clear. Pretty much all the time, all players are using more pressure than they actually need. Let's do a pressure test real quick. I'm gonna take a fourth string, eighth fret, just kind of anywhere, maybe somewhere you don't get too much of a harmonic. Push down, just click, 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 and push, push down slowly and slightly, slowly, slowly. As soon as you get a clean note, a full clean note, not a buzz note, full clean note, don't push down anymore. And it's amazing how much pressure that actually takes. That is the amount of pressure it takes to play that note. How often are we playing with that much pressure? It's just a reminder. Doing that every once in a while is like, oh, that's what it takes. And we're like squeezing, gripping, and the grip of death. So we can always relax more. Even if you think you got that going, you got that under control, there's more room to explore that and go deeper and try to get a sense of how relaxed can we be. You want the least amount of pressure possible for what is actually needed to make the sound you want. Now, of course, it takes pressure and it takes tension to, especially like we're gonna talk about the bar chord, it takes energy. So I'm not saying it doesn't, you just wanna use what's needed and not do extra. I like to think of it a lot like walking, like standing up and walking requires muscles and balance. And yes, of course you're using muscles, but you can do that in a relaxed way. You can walk and be relaxed. So you're using just what you need to to stay up. So if we're doing the grip of death here while we're playing, it's a little bit similar to if you're walking and you're, you're flexing your legs as hard as you can while you're walking. It's like that would be really debilitating and uncomfortable. That's kind of what we do when we're playing really tensely. So if you're not supposed to squeeze, where does the pressure come from? The pressure should come from as much as possible the weight of your arm. You have this whole, if you just grab this and let your elbow hang, you have, you have this gravity working for you. How much are we using the gravity 
to our advantage. It's there. The arm wants to kind of fall back. So if you if you keep it there, there's a certain amount of weight happening for us when you want to use that to our advantage. So I don't need to use my thumb for anything. There's a full chord there. No thumb. I'm in a little bit sitting in an awkward way, but here's a full bar chord. No thumb. So the thumb is fine. I think of it more like an animal's tail. Like it helps you balance a little bit and get around, but it should not be stuck or squeezed or gripping at all. I can definitely go into more detail about bar chords and kind of how to work on them step by step because I know they're a big hurdle. So if that's something of interest to you, let me know in the comments. Pitfall number four. This is my favorite one. Putting left hand fingers down on strings that you're not even playing. This is happening all the time. It's kind of more of the efficiency stuff. Like only put only put a finger down on a string that you're actually playing. Only fret a note that you actually need. This mostly applies to finger picking or individual note picking or arpeggiating chords because it's not, if you're strumming, this is why people are used to chord shapes because if you're strumming, you have to jump to a chord shape all at once. Well, that habit transfers over to playing individual notes or finger picking or arpeggiating. And it's, it's this habit where you jump to all those notes because you think of a chord shape, but yet, the pattern or the melody or whatever the arrangement or the piece is might not even need some of those. And this goes to another level as well, which is not only do you not want to put down a finger, if you're not going to use that note, it seems so obvious, you actually want to put the notes down that you need as you need them. So you want to, you don't even want to jump to a chord shape and then pluck those notes. You want to put that note down, every individual note, only right as you need it. So here's what I see happen all the time. Someone might be playing a nice finger picking pattern on a G chord and you see me playing a G chord there. Well notice this, if I lift off two of my fingers, it doesn't change at all what I'm playing because I'm not playing those strings. I'm not playing the fifth string or the top string. So this is a G chord right now and I think of it as, as a G chord. I don't need the whole shape to think of a G chord. So you do not want to put a shape down if you're not actually playing those. So let's use a song example, the song Shallow by Lady Gaga from the movie A Star Is Born. Beautiful song. The chords are E minor 7, D over F sharp, G, C, C add 9, G, D, kind of a lot going on there. The chords sound beautiful. You can play them as chords. The problem is if you want to do the finger picking part, that's the exact arrangement from the intro of the actual song and you hold these whole chord shapes or everything you're you're adding way more left hand action than you actually need if i play the real thing just only playing the notes that i need when i need them it's like this all right pitfall number five is not being dynamic and in music dynamics means volume changes, but I actually mean the general term of dynamics, like not really having motion and not changing. So there's three versions of this that happen. One is definitely the volume. Two is the timbre, and you'll see what I mean in a second. And then three is playing all the strings all the time and not choosing individual strings. This is the stuff that I call orchestrating on the guitar. It's like we have a little orchestra and we want to take advantage of all of the po possibilities that we can play with here. So for this idea of not playing all the strings all the time, if I'm playing a G chord, I'm thinking of like kind of two parts of the orchestra, like low, high, low, high, and you can definitely get into the middle as well. That's so different than if I played everything and went, So now I have low, low, high. As for volume, it's obvious you can kind of work on getting louder and more aggressive or softer and lighter, but uh, accenting I think is the most powerful thing. So you know you want to play light or you know, play loud, but I think if I add in some accenting into that as well. There's a lot you can do there. And finally, the timbre option on the guitar, if you play over here next to the neck, you get a warmer sound. If you play over here by the bridge, you get a brighter sound. On classical guitar, this is called dolce, and this is called ponticello. If I add that to the mix with this G chord groove that I had going, it might sound like this.
Now I'm exaggerating and kind of doing it a lot, but uh, so it might seem like a lot of switching back and forth, but I use those color options all the time while I'm playing. So here's a song example. I'm gonna play Heart of Gold by Neil Young and kind of use some of those dynamic options that I'm talking about. So I wanna give you a very specific tangible exercise. I'm gonna give you this one chord practice exercise that kind of rules them all. But before I do that, I just wanna ask, which one of these pitfalls are you guilty of falling into? Let me know in the comments. Or are there some that you weren't aware of at all? Let me know. Is it waiting too long to transition between chords? Is it you're playing open strings that you don't actually want in the chord? Are you squeezing your grip too much with the left hand? That's the big one. Are you putting left hand fingers down when you don't even need them because you're not even playing those strings? Or are you playing in a way that's not dynamic, that doesn't have variety in timbre or variety in volume or variety in the string choice that you're playing? Let me know in the comments and do it for other people too so they know that they're not alone if they're struggling with that same thing. Okay, quickly, this is just the specific way I want you to practice between chords. Nothing really beats this. If you need to work on chords, it's just a matter of time and doing this. You have to isolate back and forth between two chords. Seems really obvious, but really that is just the thing. Back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. But I want you to choose two chords to do that with as you work on anything challenging for you and do it in the specific way. You're going to strum a chord. I'll use a C major seven. And then you're gonna pluck all the notes to make sure they're all there. And then you're gonna strum the next chord and get there. Now, at first you do this however you slow you need to. Strum, pluck through, strum. This is A minor, add nine. And then do it in time. So that's phase two, you got. So you have to you can at, make it in time however you want. Being able to do that with any two chords that you're learning is kind of the milestone to be shooting for. If you want a bunch of fresh, beautiful chords to practice, I have a free chord chart called Chords with Color. You can just use the link in the description or go to soundguitarlessons.com slash chords with color to get that. Both those chords that I was just playing now are in there. And lastly, a few videos ago, I had a chord quiz challenge where I put a blank chord diagram on the screen and asked people to submit their answer. So I just wanna say a huge shout out to Ruben Reyes for answering and he got the chord right. I won't even say the answer because if someone wants to watch that after this and give it a shot, then you can do that. But thanks Ruben, I appreciate you and thanks for watching. I'll see you all next week with a lesson on mapping out and identifying chords in minor keys. Remember, consistency is everything when it comes to practice. Just keep showing up, keep playing, keep practicing, and let it add up little by little by little. That's it. See you soon. Thanks so much.